Okay. Um, um, so, I, I mean, I can waste one minute on introduction. Not that anyone really needs an introduction. <laughs> uh, so, uh, today's seminar is on HDF5, and if you haven't heard what that is, you probably haven't tried to store scientific data in a file. <laughs> uh, it's a pretty well-known uh, way of doing so. And uh, Quincy is certainly one of the originators of HT5 in general, and now with us at NERSC, and Seren is also in um, CRD, and they've been working on, I guess, the future of HT5, so it will be very exciting to hear about um, where HT5 can go from here. So hopefully people will trickle in as we talk once they find the password. Um, but yeah, I guess take it away, Quincy. We'll Sorry, didn't mean to cut you off. Sure thing, though. No. All right. Um, thanks, everyone, for coming. Uh, it's great to have you all here. And uh, want to acknowledge the uh, many, many team members <laughs> that we have on this project. Uh, it's fairly long running. We've been renewed by ECP at least once. So we've had a, a sequence of people in some cases. Um, primarily, it's a, it's a collaboration between LDNL, Argonne, and the HDF group, but we've had some really great um, interns, uh, particularly this summer with Kayun and John, and um, they have contributed quite a bit to the effort. So it's a broad effort um, across a lot of people. So I'll talk briefly. Many people are familiar with HDF5, so I've tried to pack it down into a reasonably short amount of slides. Um, and then kind of talk about how that applies to the ECP applications and the features that we have been working on to help uh, those app teams now and in the future. And then kind of think about, well, what does this mean in the longer run? Where, where are we going in the next few years once we get um, kind of to the end of our current milestones or how can we continue to play those forward? So, so why use HDF5, right? Um, you know, have you asked yourself, how do I deal with I.O. in the exascale? Do I need to understand the specifics of the MPI standard uh, for I.O.? And, and by the way, why is my checkpoint taking so long? Um, so HDF5 is designed to hide all that I.O. complexity so that you can concentrate on your science. That's our goal, right? Is we want to help you out by hiding those all those moving parts in a way that is really nice, easy abstractions for science uh, application teams to just work with the HDF5 API and trust that we'll do the right thing, they'll get their data back and it'll work well. So HDF5 uh, stands for Hierarchical Data Format version 5. Um, it kind of has three legs uh, that we talk about. It's, uh, it's an extendable data model. I'm not going to talk about the, the uh, components of that in the next few slides. Uh, it has a core software package, it's open source, um, but a very, very, very broad ecosystem built around that. And it's designed to do IO on um, data, of course, according to the data model, but it's built on top of lots of different kinds of backing stores. POSIX, object stores, the cloud, memory hierarchies, whatever you want. And the last thing that I want to emphasize here, and actually we're kind of gradually migrating away from, is we have a very, um, high volume, complex, data friendly file format that's um, very well defined. People have written third party readers and writers for our file formats. So we're pretty confident that we've uh, described it. And even if the software went away, you could get your data back. So the ecosystem is, as I say, uh, quite broad. There are, I mean, this is just a very small kind of old in effect. Um, subsampling of all the different teams and tools that are uh, working with HDF5 data today and in the, over the last 20 years since it started in, I think our first release was in 1997. So we've been doing this for more than 20 years. So, okay, conceptually speaking, right? HDF5 is a lot like XML. It's self-describing and has extensible typing system and it has a lot of rich metadata that users and the um, software can apply to the, the data that you create. It's also designed to be very high performance and compact, and scalable, it's like binary flat files. Um, sometimes we call HDF5, you know, the PDF of science. It's a standard interchange format. It, it contains a lot of different kinds of data in one container. 
it's hierarchical in a lot of ways. Um, you can also make it be uh, a true graph if you really feel like building your links in the way um, that that works for you, if you'd like. But it's a lot like the directory and the file system. And we provide lots of um, random access, subsetting kind of capabilities. So it's similar in some ways to databases, although it's much more friendly to science data than those are. So it's it's a broad intersection of all these guys. It's not a true superset of any of them. Um, and it has capabilities that are not included in any of these kind of related concepts and technologies. So from a data model perspective, files are containers, right? We don't, we're gradually moving away from a file is a file on the file system and opening up that concept to, well, it could be an object store system with many, many objects inside a container and you treat those as if it were a single container for the objects within it. But conceptually speaking, it's a file. It has a, um, a set of objects that uh, are supposed to belong to that file. The core object inside HDF5 are data sets, right? They're basically a multi-dimensional array of homogeneous data elements. And in order to understand how that works in the file, we need to store a description of that. So we have to have some specification about the data elements themselves and what, well, how big is this array, right? First component for the data elements we call data types. Um, in this case, I'm, I'm just naming this one, you know, it's a 32-bit little Indian integer. You can make these be arbitrarily complex. Um, nested, compound, variable length, sequence, array, fields, the whole shebang, quite complex if you'd like to have complex state elements. But it's very efficient to store floats and ints too, and uh, we describe those and um, allow you to do IO on them. For the arrayness of the array, we need to store, you know, how many dimensions is this? We call that the rank frequently. And what are the sizes of each dimension? And in fact, HDF5 allows any dimension to be unlimited in size. So you can extend an array in HDF5 in any dimension you'd like. Um, not just the slowest changing one is kind of a typical append images to a movie kind of notion of things. You can actually extend in all the other dimensions you'd like. And finally, to kind of organize these concepts, you know, the data sets in a group. We don't just want a, you know, set of them laying around in the file. We want to have some structure and hierarchy that means something semantic to the users. So that we provide groups, folders here, um, and links, which are the arrows, so that users can kind of build a semantically meaningful, science meaningful usually, um, structure out of these objects in the file. So. Every object, or sorry, every file has a root group, very much like a file system. Objects kind of like a file system. You can have hard links to more than one file. You can have links to more than one object in an HDF5 file. Um, you can also kind of have something like soft links that refer to objects in other files and other HDF5 files. But unlike normal file systems, um, HDF5 files, you can create graphs and cycles, do whatever you want. Um, and I don't necessarily recommend that, but, you know, because it can, be, can become confusing for users parsing this and like, what happened? Why is all this tangled up? But it is possible to create custom graphs if you have a need for that in some way. So all of these things together lay out something that hopefully is semantically meaningful and kind of standardized for an application. To kind of augment the basic objects, the groups, and the data sets, we provide attributes um, and they provide user metadata to generally decorate those or add information to those baseline objects. They're similar to key value pairs in that each attribute has a unique name for that object. So you can have multiple objects with the same, you know, author equals somebody um, and a value for the attribute. And the values are very similar to data sets. They are described they're basically a small array described by a data type and a data space. And they are um, designed, you know, for small things, right? They're, they're metadata. Um, we don't support partial IO. They should be small enough that you don't need to compress them. They're not complex and need to be extended. 
if you find yourself doing one of those kinds of things with an attribute, it's probably better to create a data set or some other structure in the file and then use one of the reference data types in HDF5 um, for an attribute that points at, refers to that other object or group hierarchy that you're trying to uh, work with here. So and see, would, 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 would attributes yeah. um, be used for something like provenance? Yeah, provenance works really well, unless it's like gigantic log files or something funny like that. But generally speaking, the timestamps and author information is, is very nice for attributes. Gotcha. Yeah. So in a nutshell, really fast, right? Um, this is the HDF5 data model. There's a lot more depth in here. I did not tell you about all the different kinds of varieties of data types and you know some of the more obscure things you can do with links and whatnot. But going forward, you could at least apply these four basic objects, files, data sets, groups, and attributes to problems that you hit or when people talk to you about HDF5. So how do we apply that to the ECP mission, right? The, what do we do with HDF5 within the ECP project? So our, our mission, our goal here is to work with the ECP apps um, and the facilities to meet whatever their needs are with HDF5. Uh, we plan to productize a set of HDF5 features that are appropriate for that time frame and set of machines, um, support, maintain, and release HDF5, and then also do some planning for the future, right? We don't want to just run out the end of our funding and then go, well, sorry, guys. Uh, so hopefully we'll, we'll hit to that. Here is two slides of these. There's a lot of teams that work with HDF5 and rely on it to one degree or another. Some of them are completely reliant and others of them are like, well, we have several different output formats and HDF5 is one of them. Can you guys help us out? Um, so lots of different teams, lots of different locations in the DOE, many different um, aspects, not just simulation, but machine learning or you know, working with um, facilities that are doing light sources and other kinds of data gathering. We also work with a bunch of the ST, the software technology teams to support them and build infrastructure and collaborate kind of horizontally, not necessarily that they will always use us, but they, uh, they're building tools and we should leverage them or they're gonna leverage us in some way. So when you talk to the app teams, these guys, and you look at the status and what they want, right? It's, it's mainly this thing. You're like, hey man, could you make it go faster? Oh, and by the way, the files are inconvenient. Can you make them smaller? And that's great. But what they really mean is this. They mean, give us our data back and make certain that you don't like corrupt it anywhere along the way and that we can like get it back in a few years. And we want it to go faster and get smaller and all that kind of good stuff. So if the apps are so focused on this kind of performance aspects of things, well, why are they using us then? We always tell people, well, you know, you're going to lose a little bit, hopefully not a lot of performance when you use HDF5 or some other IO middleware. And they really don't want to play with your IO middleware. They really want to do their science, right? They're not a middleware developers. And IO just doesn't produce results, right? It's not compute in the sense, right? It just preserves them and it, it IO is, kind of looks not exciting. We like it, but it's not exciting to them. Um, and realistically speaking, application teams shouldn't need to know the details about all this IO middleware. You know, it's like saying, oh, Impitch didn't perform well, go over there and optimize it. You know, you don't tell that to the app teams. You try to do, you know, the communication work uh, in Impitch and then just say, we, we took care of that for you. Don't worry, it's okay. Uh, same thing with HDF5. So that's our goal, right? The app teams, they just want someone knowledgeable to fix it. And sometimes they're not quite certain about exactly what would best help them. They say, we trust you guys, you're smart people, and we work hard to build those relationships and, and you know, build up that trust um, in order to make intelligent decisions. And when we say, hey, it would be really good if you guys did this, they go, oh, okay, sure, we'll try that. Um, they don't have to come up with all the ideas. So this is our goal, right? We keep things safe, we speed things up, and we make stuff small. That's what we, we're gonna play with the data in this way. 
kind of in detail, our goal for the ECP is, you know, we really want high quality software. The applications are running on gigantic machines. They're trusting the IOM middleware to do the right thing and to be around for a while. It's got to be well-designed, well-maintained, well-engineered software. We spend a lot of time trying to talk to app teams and learn about what it is they're trying to do and why, you know, and then say, oh, okay, or here's how we could help you or I see you have a problem. That's how we, you know, maybe you guys should change your code a little and we'll add some, you know, tweaks into HDF5 and together we move forward. And part of our responsibility really too is to look at not just today, but five to 10 years out, right? They, they want their data back. They're not going to run their binaries on new machines. They're going to recompile or update their software, but they want their data back. Um, especially some teams, you know, the, some of the nuclear weapons labs have data from before the test ban, right? So they plan to keep data in certain circumstances for quite a long time. So as part of the ECP HDF5, we said, okay, fine, great. We will go out and build a certain set of features. We'll talk about those guys. We're going to spend time talking to the app teams and tuning our software to meet their needs. And as a side effect, we decided that it would be really smart to have a performance test suite for HDF5, some set of um, small IO kernels and benchmarks that we can run on current and new systems so that we can tell, are we doing okay here? Did the performance fall off? What is this special case? Is there a reason why this got slower or faster? You know, do some decent software engineering on the performance uh, regression side of things. And also we spend a lot of time thinking about what's going to happen in the future and talking to software and hardware teams and thinking on our own about what's going to happen for new systems. So I'll kind of hit the first four of these in more detail and then kind of skip out to the future a little bit more. Um, app team stuff is is nifty when you get graphs that go, oh, well, this is five times faster for the, you know, AMREX team. But really, I kind of want to talk more about the capabilities that we're adding and where we're going in the future than specifics about an app. So this first one is finally rolled out beginning of this year, early this year, and it's called the virtual object layer. It's a nice abstraction layer within HDF5 to redirect the IO operations things that touch a file or container today um, into what we call connectors, virtual object layer connectors, ball connectors. And that's right underneath the API level. So immediately we come in, the app calls data set create, and we immediately jump into the vol connector and ask it to do the data set create operation, right? That happens kind of at an object oriented interface. And so they, they do these methods for the various kinds of objects in the data model and operations on them, reading and writing data elements and other things. They're very nice for apps because they can be transparently invoked from shared libraries. They just have to, you know, set the environment variable. App code doesn't have to change, doesn't have to be recompiled. It's great. Just as long as they linked with the newest version of HDF5, the one that has support for the virtual object layer, they can just pass um, all their data directly through something completely new, retarget onto a completely new storage system or a new mode of operation uh, without rebuilding, without re uh, recompiling at all. And these are nice, they allow you to stack them and to um, build up nice chains of things. We'll talk about that in a couple of minutes. So diagram wise, right? The HDF5 API, the apps are calling the API. Everything else that doesn't touch a container or the file that goes over into the infrastructure in the HDF5 library, which is basically unchanged when we made this uh, change to support the virtual object layers. And there's two kinds here, pass through connectors, pass the data right on through. They don't actually talk to a storage location. They're going to do some special operation. In this case, I listed a bunch, you know, that are like, do this actual operation asynchronously or cache the data for a little while before you stuff it off into a permanent container or whatever you want. There can be, pass-throughs are optional and you can stack as many of them as you like though. So zero star in regex terms. Uh, there's only one term, terminal uh, vol connector and that stores it either with the native, oops, the native traditional file format or maybe an object store system or 
in the cloud or in whatever file format that you invent. Um, and this is all very pluggable. It's a nice, well-defined public interface for people to write ball connectors. And probably 10 or 20 folks have, uh, have written connectors that they're using today with this interface. And this is one of the kind of foundational building blocks for like the next three features. Without the virtual object layer, we couldn't do, at least not the way we've done it, um, the next set of features. So this is a core infrastructure, huge upgrade that allows us to add capabilities to HDF5 that had no planning when it was designed. You can post facto change lots of the HDF5 behavior without rebuilding HDF5, without rebuilding your app, just retarget the completely different storage system uh, and just keep going. So with that in mind, we added in support for asynchronous I.O. And this is a pass-through connector. It uses background threads that we use the ArgoBots uh, thread package from Argon to help with the scheduling and, and organize those threads. Again, totally transparent to the app. Don't have to recompile. You don't have to make any code changes if you don't want to. Uh, it just executes those I.O. operations in the background on a thread. Um, there's no server, it's nothing, right? It all just runs inside your app as long as you've got a spare core or you can you know, spare a little bit of time on a thread. Uh, this works out great. So from an app's perspective over here in the diagram, it starts up, it opens a file, creates objects, writes to them, goes off and computes or, or closes the file eventually. And each of those operations is effectively a non-blocking entry into the task queue within the asynchronous vault connector. So it just says, oh, great. I will go open that file for you. Here's a placeholder so that you can keep going. And then create an object. So, oh, great. I'll go do that. Here's a placeholder so you can keep going. Go write some data. OK, sure. Great. Add all these things into the task queue. And then we try to monitor and see if the app is idle. So we idle in the sense that it's not making HDF5 calls. Um, it's gone off to compute. And then we start queuing up and executing um, the uh, I.O. operations in the background. So hopefully we've decoupled the I.O. from the compute cycle and we can hide it as much as possible. Generally speaking, it looks kind of like that, right? Compute. Typically, the old way, it would compute and do some I.O. or a checkpoint or something, right? And then go do some more compute, some more I.O., compute I.O. Hopefully, we can eliminate some or maybe all of that I.O. time with asynchronous execution and really speed up the app's appearance of what's going on with I.O., right? At the very end of each compute cycle, it starts some I.O. and that's probably a little bit of overhead. Sometimes you can get it down to very close to zero, but there's a little bit of overhead still with I.O. And then it comes back and it starts its next compute cycle, which is ideally overlapped with all the I.O. At the end, you still see this one I.O. block at the very end. Um, so eventually, we have to close the file and flush the buffers and everything else before the app terminates. We can't go into the future. Um, you still have a, a significant time savings. and um, that gets more and more as the more iterations through the compute and I.O. cycle that you make, the more opportunity we have to save I.O. time uh, for your application. So, so what's the benefit yeah. of this method over just relying on the operating system to buffer the I.O. and then asynchronously write it to the disk itself? There's certain operations in HDF5 that are essentially read, modify, write, or it's got a, a sequence of um, operations that it needs to do in order to perform your action. Update some metadata over here, update some metadata over there, and then come back to you with a new object. So we're trying to decouple anything that could potentially touch disk reading or writing um, from the IO, from the, I'm sorry, from the app. Doesn't win always. Sometimes it's fine. Sometimes you have enough memory to buffer your your um, data in memory, and and um, the OS would have done it just as well. Okay. 
so this async uh, vol connector right has two modes of operation effectively. Uh, one is the one we've been calling implicit. And if you don't want to modify your app, and that's what I've been saying, right? You can just transparently link um, to the, uh, or dynamically link to the async vol connector with this environment variable. And then it has kind of a conservative async behavior. It's like, you know, I understand that you're going to expect this buffer to be reusable when I return from my data set, right? And kind of will block to make certain we get that done. But any of the metadata things that can happen, same with reads, you know, we will we'll execute that effectively synchronously um, in order to, for the app to be able to read the buffer when it comes back from the data set read. But if the app really wants to take more control of the asynchronous operations, um, we can build those together in what we're calling event sets and then manage them in a similar, but I hope better way than MPI's uh, non-blocking operations. So this looks like on the, on the left-hand side, the implicit mode, right? It's existing HDF5 calls. User doesn't do anything different with their code. They just point at the async call connector. On the right-hand side, if they really kind of want to manage this in a more explicit way, they can create a new event set object, this ESID, and then pass that in to the all the same operations, right? Same on both and left sides here, except we're aggregating those asynchronous ops into this event set as the users proceeding along, maybe this is a checkpoint, right? They're gonna do create a file, create a group from a checkpoint, dump a bunch of data sets and data in there. And then at the end, either they compute for a while longer and allow the data set and every, I'm sorry, all the data to be written out. And then they can wait on that event set at the end of their compute or for whatever reason, if they're trying to guarantee that this is on disk at this point, they can wait earlier, right, on that event set. So and unlike- so are, are, are yeah, yeah. event sets can be large in size? It's it's a, as large as you put in there. It's, it's basically a linked list of all the operations that you added in, right? Okay. And we so, so perform them like, and close them out as they happen. So, you know, uh, plural or you know massively parallel uh, actions against data are, are interesting um, um does an event set come with a descriptor as to what type of metadata transactions might be required no it's it's a in-memory object um and it's it's really kind of boring right it's just a bag full of you know tokens for the um operations that you executed asynchronously. Okay. It's Thanks. it's just sitting there managing all those tokens for you in a nice programmable, easily uh, manageable way. So if you've used MPI's non-blocking interface ever, um, or POSIX non-blocking, it's similar, um, it gives you back a token for each object or for each operation that you perform. But that's a real pain for apps because either they have to pipeline their app in some very awkward way, interleaving compute with non-blocking operations and hoping that it all works out in order to get dependencies, right? If this has to be done first and then that, they've got to manage that. On the other hand, even if things are kind of embarrassingly parallel and they not know there's no dependencies between them, you end up with the N tokens running around inside your app and you have to manage them all again. So the really big advantage we feel for application developers that these guys are, there's a single token, it's this event set ID um, that they have to manage. Put as many things as they want in there to happen during this set of asynchronous operations, it's great. You only have to touch one ID thing and keep track of that. And internally within the vol connector, we manage these dependencies, right? So we'll guarantee that the file gets created before you use the file to create the group. And likewise, the group must get created before the data set gets created and then the data written to it. In some cases, you know, we can parallelize things out. If there were 10 data sets in the group, we could fan those out, right? Because they only need to depend on the group getting created. They don't depend on each other. Some things are more sequential, but at least it's asynchronous and offloaded into the background. One way or the other, we manage all these um, dependencies. We correctly handle collective parallel metadata IO, all the goodness there, that's all fine. Um, 
and this set of code will execute and produce identical results to the one on the left, the implicit sequence, which is identical to what you would run in if you ran it serially, sequentially, whenever it's synchronously, without the async connector. So that's async IO. Any other thoughts or questions about that? So going on, the other aspect that we I mentioned earlier is system and topology aware IO. And this is, I'm certain I've missed some locations where data could be, as well as connections between them. But this is already gnarly enough, right? Um, we've got all these different places where there's a memory buffer, effectively, RAM or disk or tape or whatever you want to think of it as, and they're all connected together. And they're getting deeper and deeper over time. It's not, you know, 10 years ago even, we just had CPUs and a parallel file system. And it was pretty straightforward. You knew what they were doing. Um, today, we got all this running around. And tomorrow might be more or less, you know. And not every system has a burst buffer or no local storage or is connected to the outside world. But, you know, conceptually, there's a lot of pieces moving around here. We really don't want the application teams to be thinking about this. That's our whole point for the IO middleware guys, right? So we'd like to make this smoother and easier for the application teams to develop. With that in mind, and building on all the technologies that we've kind of talked to from here, um, we have this caching vol connector. And it's primarily focused at no local storage today, but with a pluggable design, we can evolve it towards caching at any level in that hierarchy, right? We could say, oh, this, this one manages data on the burst buffer, and that one manages data in the parallel file system and the tape, and whenever we'd like it to happen. And some of it isn't cache then in the proper sense that we would normally think of cache. So we'll probably rename this guy to a location manager or something. But today, what it does is you can stack the async vol connector on top of this guy, and he will cache um, I.O. That, it, that gets performed in node local storage, and then return it back to the app as it's occurring. Um, and we're just in the process of implementing the update where we can stack the caching connector on top of another async connector, so he could, in the background, be evicting things from his, or prefetching, things from the cache that it's stored on the uh, node local storage. And that's this part here in the bottom left, right? You can stack these small connectors, right? You can build anything you'd like. And the app is completely unaware of all this. You can sidestep modifying HDF5 and modifying the app and build up stackable connections across the memory in your system, the different locations where data could reside. Um, and so we think that's where we're gonna go in the future. I'll talk about it a little bit more in the last few slides. So these are two of the other aspects that we've worked hard to um, really enable good performance for today's apps and ones in the next few years with ECT. So another kind of twist on this is what we called subfiling. So, you know, single file, shared file is traditional for HDF5, but it's kind of slow sometimes with mocking contention and other IO bandwidth, you know, difficulties. Uh, so what happens instead of storing in a single shared file behind the scenes underneath the covers to the user, we shard that up into a set of pieces, um, subfiles, and then create another metadata file that describes how all that all works together. Uh, we get better use of the parallel file system, hopefully reduce the mocking contention issues to improve the performance. And in theory, um, this was very prototype -y, like hack hacking together code, right? But on Cori, we can see some moderately significant um, 2x, 3x in this very prototype code. Um, 10x, not the 10x there, 6x. Um, so we have some pretty high hopes that this could work out. Um, another tuning the IO 
components to the the behavior of the underlying storage in, in good topology aware system aware ways uh, and this builds on the um, vault connector notion and is likely to extend back into hdf5 with some feature updates to the core library as well just to uh, enable it over there this is in a sense subfiling is an idea that's been around for quite a while i mean muster does this with you know scraping but here we are doing it up at the, at the higher level and giving the apps more portability to their data and more control over what's going on at the software level we hope so finally okay fine gpus are coming right um this stuff works fine because we've got cuda you know data transfers and other kind of similar technologies with hip or one api whatever um but this stuff doesn't work at all yet, right? You, if you've got GPU private memory, um, you pretty much have to send it back over to the CPU and then get it out through the CPU's memory back into some file system. But NVIDIA and other uh, vendors are working on how do we change that, right? So we've been working with NVIDIA for this summer with John Robbie's effort um, to allow their GPU direct I.O. to work correctly with HDF5. And what that's going to do is change the HDF5 libraries infrastructure. This is a big blue chunk here in the middle, right? All the guts of HDF5 that the apps call into from the top. And at the very bottom that we talk POSIX or MPIO or whatever else you want. And John's effort were, was to add in a new driver at the bottom that speaks GPU direct storage, GDS. And this was worked out really, really well. Um, it's a drop-in replacement for the POSIX VFD. Um, it's a nice single call to enable from the apps and works perfectly. Passes all the HDF5 regressions, test suites. Um, it's ready for beta testing. If you feel like playing it out, you have to have a GDS capable machine and all that goodness. Uh, but it is there and available for people to work on. And the performance can be pretty good. Um, the green bars over here, the GDS read and write rates. Um, I'm still kind of working on why is the read not quite so good. But um, this is very early, right? Very preliminary, one single thread, one GPU, single NVMe. So, um, but we are showing that, you know, GPU direct storage can outperform um, IO from the CPU or the data transfer back to the CPU and then IO from there. The unfortunate, sort of part of this is that it only works in serial HDF5, right? Because we're replacing the POSIX driver inside HDF5. But in HDF5, when we want to do parallel I.O., we rely on the MPI library um, to do that for us, right? We just make MPI I.O. calls and, you know, boom, magic happens. Uh, so right now, the developers on both the OpenMPI and the MPitch teams are making progress on supporting GDS IO for the MPI libraries, which will therefore enable uh, HDF5 to do parallel IO from GPU native, you know, private GPU memory um, in the future, as soon as these guys get stable and, and roll out this capability for MPI. And HDF5 won't have to change in that case, right? He'll just invoke the MPI IO call and it will correctly take the buffer directly from GPUs memory out to disk. So again, playing with these ideas in the system topology, getting changed and updating. Um, but in the future, we have this gnarly diagram, right? Um, and we really don't think that application teams, application developers, A, have enough time, right? And B, have enough desire, you know, knowledge and desire to go write custom data movement pieces for their apps. And they're gonna to have to port them between one machine and the other, and they're gonna be constantly dealing with this. So this is a real opportunity for our IO middleware teams to step up and, and lead out with some new abstractions and some new capabilities. So we've been discussing over the last few weeks what we have to find a good name, um, but a data movement DSL, right? We'd like to come up with some 
high level description of where are the data, where is the data in this system? How is those, how are those locations connected? What are the various properties of those? You know, this one's high bandwidth, this is how big the memory is or the burst buffer is or whatever. And then, well, okay, what do you want to have happen? When the burst buffer gets 90% full, start evicting data to the parallel file system. Oh, okay, that's a good behavior to have, something, right? So this is where we're kind of focusing. We want the apps to be able to create some very high level description of what they'd like to have happen and then build up a nice stackable set of vault connectors inside HDF5 and apply those policies and descriptions to that stack of vault connectors. And we're, we've got the components, right? Kind of been showing you the components along the way. Um, and we think in the next year or two, maybe we'll be able to implement some good pieces of this. Um, and so really allow the apps to do stuff. Yeah. Hey. Alongside those four, which are a very good four, uh, could be the, the resource uh, expectations. Or, or oh, like how much I'm going to use? Or, well, expectations could be either the addresses of uh, specific resources that, that are uh, required or, um, or performance expectations. Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, I mean, like I said, we're very new. We don't even have a, you know, a, a concrete example of language sketch. So yeah, sure. Resources uh, would be good to apply in there too. Well, it's, it's really about, um, well, I have two comments. It's really about quality of service, right? It's not, which is related to resources, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, the second comment I would make is that I, I think this picture is ridiculously overly pessimistic. Um, I don't think sure. any, any architect is going to build anything as complicated as this because of the reasons that exactly you outline. Nobody's going to mm -hmm. have no local and burst buffer. Yeah, I mean, I threw that one in there just because they both exist and I didn't want somebody to say, but we have a burst buffer. Yeah, I know. Yeah, it's, a, it's, uh, it's, a, it's an all to all map and, and you did a good job of mapping out which parts make sense. Yeah, so I, I, don't, I don't expect to have both no local and burst buffers, but if you take the burst buffer out, it's pretty good. Okay. You could add in a few more connections. Like I don't connect CPU private memory to another CPU private memory, you know, like MPI communication. Um, there's, you know, we could sit there and draw arrows in here and talk. But the notion still stands, right? The app teams don't want to have to think about this craziness. Um, they just want to have some, hopefully, default, right? When you install HDF5 on a system, there should, we're, we're trying to play with the idea is there should be some just default description that the system guys, you know, install for that machine. And like, you know, this is how our system operates. It's not going to change really rapidly, right? Um, and there should be a way for an app team to override that or to emphasize certain aspects or the other. But basically the default behavior should be a whole lot better if we could just get some kind of general behavior that's a little more tuned into the, what the machine's architecture is. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of prior art here. The Best Buffer project spent a lot of time thinking about this question. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, it's got its own pseudo DSL also. I mean, maybe it's a real DSL if you think about it that way. For what do I want to do with the burst buffer? Right, exactly. Yeah. GDS is a great idea in any case. Yeah, that'll help. That's, that's, that, that's really good. So, I mean, this is this is where I'm I'm finished up, right? Um, we're funded by the DOE, uh, lots of great teams and lots of hard work uh, by teams at Argonne, you know, Berkeley and HDF Group, as well as you know interns for the summers at North Carolina and and Northwestern. Um, any more thoughts, comments, questions? I can flip back over here to the fancy diagram. Thanks, Vinci. Uh, yeah, any other questions? We have quite a while. All I, all I would, my meta comment would be, uh, I think over the last 
five years at least, every uh, problem I've seen specified a computer scientist has come along and said that DSL is the answer to that. So I'd just be a little bit wary of specifying just an, yet another DSL. Uh, yeah, well, I'm like, well, hoping that you don't have to. DSLs. Yeah, I hope they don't have to deal with them very much. Only if they got some crazy idea. Yeah. And, there, and the moment for the GPU direct storage, hmm? you do have to. <clears throat> you do have to do something. Is that right? <laughs> so, to put it. You have to use this H, the the GDS vault connector if you want. Yeah, you have to use the this guy. Whoops, this this guy, the GDS um, virtual file driver at the bottom level. Um, virtual files drivers are below within effectively or the native vault connector. But yeah, you have to choose that guy. Um, the nice thing about it is that. We're still working with NVIDIA and exactly how to make this work out in detail, but it seems possible to auto detect whether the buffer is actually a GPU buffer or a CPU buffer. And we might be able to just make GDS be the default. That seems wild, but I don't, so I'm not certain about that, but um, it at least is possible to tell whether your buffer is in which pool of memory. Okay. Quincy? Mm -hmm. So let's say I want to test it on Cori GPU with TensorFlow module. How far are you from letting me do it? I mean, we can let you do it. It's not our problem, man. Uh, no, uh, we got to convince Jack and Doug and the you know all the people to update the OS on Cori's GPU nodes to be GDS compatible. So it's OS level upgrade. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Have you ever approached them about this? Ask them what are their plans about this? We've been talking, yeah. Um, I, don't, I don't think it's right, a really near-term idea for them yet. But um, if we had more users like you, um, then we could say, hey, we have real users. Do you think you can prioritize that a little bit higher? So you mean I should just block the whole system with my jobs and say this because of my... <laughs> Yeah. And then sure. say printing as a solution and okay. <laughs> well, yeah, right. Thank you. Throw me into the fire. I appreciate that, John. Hey, uh, Quincy, I have a d different question, um, yeah. which is uh, more more on the attributes uh, side of things. Mm -hmm. um, sure. You know, HDF is a is a luckily a multi stakeholder uh, undertaking. You know that has mm -hmm. lots of, mm -hmm. lots of people interested in it. Um, but you know, I'm, I'm wondering whether or not um, HDF ha has thought about bolting in provenance at, at a more fundamental level. Um, so one one way to do that would be, um, I mean, just throwing out ideas is is sort of providing a foothold for uh, ORCID or or other identifiers um, that that when an action or an event set happens, that it could be connected to uh, either who or why that happened? Yeah, uh, I would volunteer that we've done some work in that area. I have a prototype, flipping back here to the ball connector diagram here. Um, we have a prototype provenance pass through ball connector. So it's, it's, a, it's designed to take record, uh, I guess just to record, uh, the operations that occur on an HDF5 container, a file, and then log that however you'd like. Um, Using like uh, Geekos and, and, and POSIX or? Right now it's actually a kind of a more of a baseline implementation that's more plain text logging. Uh, we kind of were figuring out how to uh, enable Darshan logging. And, Surin, I don't know if we ever finished that. We got farther on, yeah, on that. We, we haven't. We haven't finished that uh, because we kind of uh, asked for future funding on that. One of the things that we want to do is use more um, standard provenance li uh, sta uh, libraries and um, formats such as RDF and Provo uh, mm -hmm. standards. So that 
So yeah, that, that's a work in progress or somewhat near term future work. Yeah, I mean, the, the, there's some um, like sim some simplicity and and uh, reason to you know treat key value pairs just you know in the abstract, but um, you know kind of recognizing how people uh, wield data sets, um, yeah. you you know potentially could bolt on some some easy features. Yeah, th yeah, there is a lot of uh, provenance work is already out there, so we can take advantage of this RDF for uh, and uh, Sparkle type of querying make available on these. So yeah, yeah. So nice thing about the pass throughs, you can do anything you want and just kind of let the rest of the data in the operation pass on in to the file. So. Close to the top of the hour, got time for another question or comment. Okay. Well, thank you all. Um, again, if you want any more information, contacting Siren and I or anyone else on the team um, is more than welcome. We, we'd love to talk and hear about other cases and interesting ideas. Thanks all. <laughs>